How big is your God? Job 34, 1 to 37. Aladdin had a genie. The genie stayed in the lamp. And whenever Aladdin wanted that genie, all he had to do was rub the lamp and the genie would come out and say, your wish is my command. And the genie did exactly whatever Aladdin wanted him to. What is unfortunate is that Christians, the same way they view the genie is the way they view God. This is what God should be like. We ask and he needs the answer. And whatever we ask, he cannot refuse. And this, in one way, is what Job had done. He had boxed God up. His concept of God was small. He thought since he was obedient that he should not have suffered. And if he did suffer, God was therefore unfair. On the other hand, his friends also boxed God up. They made God small. They said to Job that since, Job, you have suffered... You must have sinned because God never hurts the innocent. So Job and his friends boxed God up and they made him small. But Elihu, uh, he taught that suffering doesn't mean that you've sinned. It doesn't mean that God is unfair. But suffering is something that God uses to teach us to look to God. So Elihu had a big view of God while Job and his friends had a small view. And here in chapters 34... 237, Elihu would show how big this God actually is. And although we've read only ver only chapters 34, I'd encourage you to read uh, the rest uh, of these chapters, 35 to 37. And there are four points that we can draw from uh, these chapters. Firstly, God is sovereign. Secondly, God is not a genie. Uh, thirdly, our duty in suffering. And fourthly, God is a big God. So firstly, God is sovereign. Now in Job 34, uh, Elihu challenged the smallness of Job's theology, also the friend's theology. And he did this by reasoning. In verses 2 to 4, Elihu said, and of course these are my words, Listen to me, wise men. Give me your ear. You smart people, let your ears hear my words like your mouths taste food. Let us discern what is right and learn together what is good. That's the gist of what he was saying. And Elihu inviting them to reason with him is what God frequently does in the Bible. In Isaiah, uh, God said, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul himself told the Corinthian church, if you are wise, judge what I say. So discern. So Elihu here was inviting them and in that sense, inviting us to discern what he says about God, that God is a big God. So the first thing uh, he says is that God is sovereign. And this is a theology, this is a statement that all Christians uh, will purport to believe in. We believe that he is sovereign, but sometimes the journey from the head to the heart takes longer than we anticipate. While we do believe it, uh, we do not necessarily uh, internalize it. And Job did believe that God was sovereign when he lost his family, his farm and his flesh, uh, what he said was, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. So Job did have a big uh, idea of, of, of God. But when his suffering was prolonged, when he went through weeks and perhaps even months of that suffering, uh, his view of God became smaller. It came to the point where Job, in his frustration and despair, concluded that God must be unjust. Now in verses 5 to 6 of Job 34, Elihu quotes uh, what Job had said. Uh, he said, I am righteous, and God hath taken away my judgment. Should I lie against my right? My wound is incurable without transgression. So this is what our grand old translation says. What is the meaning? Uh, Job was complaining that 
because God brought this incurable uh, suffering to Job, and Job didn't have any transgressions, Job didn't have any sins deserving those kinds of suffering, therefore God was unjust. And because God, uh, because Job couldn't understand why he suffered, you know, having this turmoil in himself, he thought to himself in verse 9, there's no profit in pleasing God. You know, sometimes it's, it's, it's like that for many uh, believers. We think we're serving God, we think we're obeying Him, and our lives aren't getting better. And sometimes people wonder, why bother going to church? Why bother pleasing God? So Job had put God in a box, and that's what many people do. You know, it's a kind of uh, I scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of uh, philosophy. You know, if I do good, I expect that God must do good back to me. And since God didn't scratch Job's back the way he wanted it, Job asked, uh, why bother serving God at all? So Job's view of God was small. And in response to this, Elihu had to remind Job of God's justice. Uh, verses 10 to 12, and of course, these are my words again. Uh, he said here, listen to me, wise guy. That God is wicked is furthest from the truth. No, God actually repays people according to their deeds. He actually treats them like they deserve. So God is not wicked. Neither is he unjust. This was a truth that Job faltered on. Now, it was a truth that he believed. It was a truth that his friends had told him. You know, they told him, God is just, so because you're punished, that means you're unjust. Job initially believed this, but he started to doubt and he started to think, well, I've suffered when I've not done anything wrong, so God must be unjust. So Elihu here, uh, in one sense, repeats the words of Job's friends. But what Job and Job's friends got wrong is that while God will give to the righteous their rewards, and while God will punish uh, the unjust, but God does not do that according to our time. You know, that's what was sung earlier in Psalm 73. Uh, the wicked are prospered and firm in their strength. No pangs do they suffer, though death come at length. They scoff and the helpless, they proudly oppress the heavens and the earth they assume to possess. So the wicked are prospering now. Um, so how is it true that God will reward them with punishment? Now, we also sang in Psalm 73, I went to God's temple, my doubts were dispelled. The end of life's journey I clearly beheld. I saw in what peril ungodly men stand with sudden destruction and ruin at hand. So the unrighteous now, they're prospering. But the psalmist realized that one day, God will give them their just rewards. Not yet, one day. So was what Elihu said true? That God gives to the unrighteous what they deserve? Yes, but not yet, one day. You see, the problem with Job is that he wanted deliverance now. He wanted vindication and relief now. And if it didn't come to him now, uh, then God was not fair. So Elihu had to tell Job that no, God is just. And God is sovereign. God acts when he wants to. Now verses 13 to 15, uh, these verses here tell us that God is sovereign and he's in charge of the whole world. Uh, these verses tell us that he orders the universe. Life and death are in his hands. God answers to no one. You know, he can act whenever he wants to, and he doesn't have to act when we want him to act. So God can right wrongs now if he wants to. He doesn't have to. But the thing that we know is that God, because he is just, 
one day he will right all wrongs. So Elihu was telling Job that Job had no right to question God. You know, Job was in despair. He was confused. You know, he'd been told that God is just, but in his experience, God was not just. But what he did not realize is that God is just and will act in his own time. So Elihu told Job that you have no right to question God. Verses 17 to 19. You know, does a man question the king? Does a man question uh, the princes? You know, when we suffer, we may cry out and pray for relief. It may or may not come according to God's providence, according to God's sovereignty. And so in those times, we cannot accuse God of being unjust because he is not. Uh, Things will be made right one day. And we mustn't forget that in our prolonged suffering, in our crying out for relief, but God doesn't give it, He will give it one day, but in this prolonged trouble, verse 21 tells us that God still sees what is happening. He takes note. It reads, for his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. So God takes note of everything that man says and does. You know, the good that man does, he sees it. The suffering that man goes through, he sees it. The wicked that man does, he also sees it and he takes note. And even if he does not judge it now, he will judge it one day. Jesus even said the same thing, that every idle, man, idle word that man speaks uh, you know, will be judged one day. And Elihu said in verses 26 to 30, uh, God also takes note of our cries and suffering. So this is, a, I think, a reminder for those of us who go through our trouble. Uh, we may box God up. We may think he is unfair. We may look at all the injustices in the world and we may say that God is not acting. He is not just. But Elihu's point is God is just. God does take note. But God is sovereign. He acts when he wants to. And we cannot charge him with injustice just because he doesn't act the way we want him to. Just because he is not our personal genie doesn't mean that God is not powerful, doesn't mean that God is not sovereign, doesn't mean that he is not good because God is sovereign. So the second point that Elihu wants to impress upon Job is that God is not a genie. As I said, Job had come to a point where he was questioning God. You know, he had asked, why bother pleasing God? He's not scratching my back. And in chapter 35, uh, verse 3, uh, he asked again, what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? So in chapter 34, he says, why bother pleasing God? In chapter 35, he's saying, why bother being holy? What's the use of being obedient to God? I'm not rewarded. I've been good, but where are my rewards? So Elihu here examined these words. And he basically said that this attitude uh, that Job had, why bother being holy, is a common attitude. People often only go to God in times of trouble. You know, uh, just like the genie in the lamp, uh, Aladdin would only go to him if he had something he wanted. And uh, Elihu described this attitude in verses 9 to 11. You know, every other time Aladdin did not need the genie, the genie was not called. But only when he was in trouble or when he wanted something, then the genie would be called. And in verses 9 to 11, uh Elihu explains this attitude, and let me translate it in a way that we can understand, but please look at the verse, verses 9 to 11. People cry out when they are oppressed. They groan. Yet, normally, they don't ask, where is God my creator, the one who gives songs in the night? Where is the one who makes us smarter than the animals and wiser than the birds of the sky?' 
you know, Elihu was basically saying that in times of trouble, that's when men seek God. They cry out to God. They groan. We want him to fix our problems now. But at other times, we're not crying out for a relationship with him. You know, this creator God, this God that has made all things, has made us smarter than the animals, wiser than the birds of the sky. You know, we don't seek him out. So this is a common behavior. We only seem to go to God in times of trouble and not to seek a relationship with him. And this also is a small view of God. Because God is creator. Why do we treat him like a genie? And Elihu pointed something to Job, a question that must be asked of each of us as well. You know, why do we expect God to help us when we attack him? You, you know, uh, in the story of Aladdin, or at least in the Disney version, you have the evil African magician, uh, the one who tricked um, uh, Aladdin to think that he was his uncle. You know, when he finally got his hands on the lamp and he rubbed the lamp and the genie came out, uh, he was very abusive to the genie. He was unkind. He was demanding. And the genie had to do whatever he wanted him to. Well, not exactly the same. Uh, Job had cried out. He had complained. He had charged God foolishly. He had blamed God. He called God unjust. And so Elihu was now asking Job, why should God answer you? You know, God does not answer the proud. God is not a genie. You know, the evil African magician, the genie had to listen to him, even though he was abusive. But this is God. This is your creator. How can you be so abusive with your words and so proudly foolish and you expect God to answer you? Now, this is what he says in verse 12. There they cry, but none, but God giveth no answer because of the pride of evil man. In despair, we can sometimes charge God foolishly. Uh, this is what Mrs. Job did. You know, she asked Job at the beginning of his trials, why are you holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And he in turn said, why are you like one of those foolish women that charge God foolishly? You see, in times of trouble, uh, we can be like this. We can be so foolish, but we have to remember that God is not a genie. God cannot be abused and then give us whatever we want. So if God is not a genie, and if he is a sovereign God, and if he is a big God, then what is our duty when we do go through suffering? I mean, can we cry out to God? Can we complain to him? By all means, that's what the scripture says. You know, uh, you know, even when the Israelites were in Egypt, when they were under slavery, God told Moses that he had heard the cries of his people. You know, uh, in, in the book of Revelation, uh, God hears the cries of the saints who suffer. So can we cry? Yes. But here in Job, and we're looking now at verse at chapter 36, what is our duty when we go through suffering? In verses 6 to 12 of chapter 36, Elihu reveals an important truth. God is the one who sends trials. He's the one who sends suffering. Uh, verse 8, uh, there will also be affliction. Uh, verse 10, there will be discipline that comes into our lives. So life is not a walk in the park. It is hard. There will be difficulties that come to us. But when we go through suffering, what is our duty? Now, when people go through affliction, there's usually one of two ways of reacting. There's the godly reaction and the ungodly reaction. So let us take a look first at the ungodly reaction because uh, that's what Elihu uh, addresses first. When people go through suffering uh, and God is the one who sends suffering, people can react 
in an ungodly way. Uh, verse 12 to 14 say, says, But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath. They cry not when he bindeth them. They die in youth, and their life is among the unclean. So what Elihu here is saying after from verses 8 to 10, talking about how God is the one that sends suffering and, and discipline and problems and afflictions, there are some that do not react obediently when they go through these things. Now, when trouble comes, uh, very often the common reaction is sin. We harden our hearts uh, rather than uh, suffering long and listening to God. You know, in the family, when the child misbehaves, you fathers will know, like me, what our normal reaction is in the flesh. We get in a bad mood, we want to punish the child, we can be mean to the child in our words. You know, or when the spouse is cold, you know, the other spouse might, you know, find warmth in the arms of another person or, you know, uh, find a fulfillment somewhere else. And those of us, you know, who have bosses over us, you know, when the boss is bad, sometimes we think, uh, you know, in a fit of anger, we throw the resignation paper, you know, right on his desk. So sometimes when they're suffering, we do not obey God. We react in a sinful manner. And there are plenty of examples in the scripture you know, in the wilderness, when the ten spies came back from the promised land and they said it was too hard to possess the land, the Israelites wanted to return back to Egypt. They rebelled against God. They rebelled against Moses. And Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 to 9, warns us against that spirit of rebellion uh, with these words. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today... If ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. So when there was that threat of suffering, they reacted sinfully, and they rebelled against God, and they were punished because of that. So... The writer of the Hebrews uh, was writing uh, especially to covenant children who, because of suffering, because of the cares of the world, because of many things, they started not to believe and they wanted to return back to the world. They wanted to abandon Christ. And the writer to the Hebrews was saying, don't do that because there will be greater punishment that will come. So when we do have suffering, don't react in sin. But let suffering be a vehicle to move us closer to God. Don't use it as an opportunity to sin. Because the people of God humble themselves in suffering. You know, we, we ought not to run away from God, but to run to God. And that's what verse 21 says. Uh, Take heed, regard not iniquity. Uh, that's, of course, in... <clears throat> Chapter uh, 36, uh, verse 21. Be careful. Turn away from sin. In your suffering, do not sin. Uh, but of course, very often when affliction comes, we do sin. Uh, just like the father with a bad mood, you know, the spouse with a cold husband, the employee with a bad boss, we see in the Bible many examples like Peter. When he was afraid, he denied Christ. When Moses was angry, he hit the rock. When Judas was ashamed, he betrayed Christ. But that's not what we should do. And we have a lot of other examples of saints who reacted in a godly manner when they went through suffering. You have the example of David who was pursued by Saul. He touched not the Lord's anointed. When Joseph was seduced by Mrs. Potiphar, uh, he chose to run away. He resisted temptation. And when Jesus was crucified, uh, of course, 
Jesus did cry out to God, let this cup pass from me. But when he was crucified, he drank of that cup and he even asked God to forgive his tormentors. So this is the godly reaction. This is our duty when we go through suffering. Not to doubt God, not to foolishly charge God, not to um, react in sin and box God up, but the godly reaction, the duty that we must fulfill is to listen to God, to serve him despite suffering. You know, verse 10, we saw that God is the one who sends affliction and suffering. And verse 11, it says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. And I suppose this is very hard for us to imagine when you're going through suffering. How do you stay the course? How do you not blame God? But Elihu said, if you obey in that suffering, then you will prosper. In spite of the suffering, God will reward in his time. Verse 15 says, he delivereth the poor in his affliction and openeth their ears in oppression. So God in his own time will deliver those that suffer. You know, Jesus pressed on despite the suffering because he knew that his reward was in heaven. You know, what, what, what does the book of Hebrews say? You know, he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And even the martyrs of old, why did they not deny Christ? Why did they pursue Christ despite all the suffering? Because they knew that when they got to heaven, they will have a crown. They will be clothed in white. You know, it reminds us, uh, you know, uh, of, of Jim Elliot and his friends. They all had these guns and the, the rifles, but when the Aka Indians came at them, they could have, you know, lifted up their rifles and shot these savages, but they didn't. You know, they knew that there was something better. So when we suffer, when we are tempted to sin, let us remember to cry out to God, uh, to complain to him, but not to charge him foolishly. Let us not sin in word nor in action. Now, again, it's not wrong to cry out to God. It's not wrong to uh, complain to him, even as David did. But let us not charge him foolishly, especially knowing the kind of God that we do have, who is good, who is sovereign. And that's the last point that Elihu wanted to impress upon Job, that God was a good God and God is a big God. We may not be able to understand everything, but we need to know that God is an immense God. You know, when we go through suffering, we know that God has sent them. We are, after all, uh, schooled very well in the Reformed Confessions. In Scripture, we know that God is sovereign. But do we understand everything when we go through suffering? We don't. Because God is a big God. You go through good times. You're blessed you're overwhelmed. You ask, what have I done to deserve all of this? Can you understand the goodness that you have received? You can't, because God is a big God. So this is Elihu's point here uh, in Job 36, verse 26. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Or more colloquially, look, God is greater than what we can understand. And Elihu here explained to, to, to Job how God was great in two ways. So, firstly, he explained that God is great even in terrible things. In verses 32 to chapter 37, verse 5, uh, Elihu used an illustration of lightning and thunder. You know, when there's lightning and when there's thunder... Uh, kids get afraid, animals get afraid. 
And Elihu was trying to illustrate that God is like lightning. He is hidden behind the clouds. Verse 32, the light is behind the clouds. We don't necessarily see the light. But how do we know that there's lightning? We know it because there's thunder. Verse 33, and even the cattle you know, of the field, they can sense that electrical charge. So what Elihu is saying is, in times of suffering, when terrible things thunder, when we are scared, when our hearts tremble, and we listen to this thunder all around us, we need to realize that God is the lightning behind this thunder. God is behind all the terrible things that happen. And we may not be able to see God clearly, like lightning behind the clouds, but we can certainly hear the thunder, our suffering, and sometimes our suffering is tough and loud. Elihu's point was simple. Uh, God is the one who is behind it. You may not be able to understand it. God is big. God is bigger. And so, Job, when you suffer, God is still good. God is big. And you may not be able to understand all things, the reasons for all things. Secondly, God is also behind good things. And we may not be able to understand everything about good things either. For example, as I said before, things might just be happening. They're great. You know, uh, by God's providence, he lines up everything in order. And you wonder in humility, how, what did I do to deserve all of these things? So even you yourself, you don't understand. So here, Elihu, to describe this, he used the illustration of the sun. Job 37, verse 21. But now men see not the bright light which is in the clouds, but the wind passeth and cleanseth them. Now, what is the imagery that Job is trying to, or rather that Elihu is trying to tell Job? Now, the sun is hidden, is also hidden behind clouds. Um, the sun is good. It gives life to all. And when the wind blows away the clouds and clears everything, then you actually see the sun uh, as brightly as you can. But even then, can any of us look directly into the sun? We cannot. So Elihu's point is simple. Uh, God, in good times, he is greater than what we can understand. You know, in bad times, we may not be able to understand all things, but God is big. We don't know the reason for them. So because of all of these things that God is big, he is the cause of all things, good and bad, we may not be able to understand it. Elihu was telling Job that God is not a genie. Job, you can't just expect that since you have not sinned, that you should not suffer. You don't understand God. And that's the same with us, you know. It's the same with us. We think, why do these terrible things happen to me? What have I done? But this shows that we do not understand God. We've boxed God in. You know, he becomes a genie. So in all things that happen in our lives, especially in difficult times, God is not unjust. He is sovereign, and the thing we need to remember is he will not give us what we want immediately. He sees all things, and he will bring to pass all things according to his justice. So as we suffer, we need to look to his majesty to run to him. Now, just some practical applications. I want to address this in our suffering. You know, we may have a lot of disappointments in life. Our loved ones uh, have suffered. We have suffered. You know, we have prayed. We have asked God to help. But the answers are not forthcoming or the answers are not the answers that we want. And so we ask, is God unfair? Now, we know the answer to that. He is not unfair. And while disappointed, we know that God is still good. But have we, in our struggles, reacted sinfully? 
Have we in our sins perpetuated our suffering for ourselves and others? And have we forgotten the great and good God that we have? And why do we react in anger when difficult things happen? Um, because we forget that God is good. Why do we react in excess grief when things don't go our way? Because we forget that God is good. And we can't see his bigness uh, even in our suffering. But God is bigger uh, than our lives. He's bigger than our jobs. You know, he's even bigger than this pandemic. He's bigger than everything. And God, he is working uh, uh, through things to bring about his will. His will is good. The culmination is at the end. And so despite our suffering, despite the clouds and the thunder, what we need to know is that the land beyond, when everything will be made right in heaven, uh, that land will be far better and brighter than what we have here. And we can't understand that bright future now. And the reason because is, you know, we all we see at times are thunderclouds. But we need to remember that God rights all wrongs one day. And even though we don't understand all things now, uh, one day we will see it. And the reason why we do have access to that better land, the reason why we do have access to the place where uh, the light will always shine, uh, the reason why we have access uh, to a place without suffering is because of Christ. You know, God sent him to suffer for us so that we would not suffer eternally. Uh, God was the one who blotted out the sun at Jesus' crucifixion. He was the one that poured out his wrath upon Christ so that he would eventually shine upon us. So we do not understand all things that happen to us now, uh, even in good times and bad times. But what we are assured of is that God is a big God and that he will make things right one day. So if we go through suffering, let us run to him, never doubting that he is good and that he is always just and that he reigned injustice upon Christ so that we could receive justice. So may that be an encouragement to us even as we continue to decipher the words of Job, let us remember one thing, that we serve a big and good God, even though we may not be able to understand everything. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, remind us once again how sovereign and how big you are and that we should not box you in and un try and understand you apart from what scripture says. Help us to cry and complain to you in times of despair because we trust in you and not because we are charging you. And we know, Lord, that one day we will understand all things. And until that day, uh, we pray that you would teach us to walk humbly, to do justly, to love mercy, to be obedient, to suffer well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.